Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and hopefully you're having an amazing day. I want to start this video by discussing AMD and an ARM-based processor. Yep, that's right. AMD may actually be creating an ARM-based CPU, which may be, well, at the very least working alongside the x86 architecture that it has in its back pocket. As you are doubtlessly aware by now, there's been a lot of discussion of ARM and uh, the dethroning of x86 because of Apple's M1 silicon. While I do grant you that Apple were not exactly super forthcoming with the benchmarks, putting it mildly, it has ignited a lot of discussion of late in the industry as to the benefits of ARM and some of the problems of the more legacy design of x86. In fact, very recently I also had my own exclusive that NVIDIA were working on their own uh, alternative to x86 and it does indeed employ ARM. Now obviously NVIDIA have a lot of control over ARM, especially if their purchase of the company goes through. But AMD are not resting on their laurels, as there's a very interesting tweet from Mori QHD, hopefully I've pronounced that name correctly. I'll link, of course, their tweet in the video description. They've stated that there are two chips that AMD are creating. One has integrated RAM, and the other one has, well, no integrated RAM. This prototype is, quote, almost ready, although, as the time I'm recording this video, there is no additional information. They've basically just said that this information is hot off the presses. It's just a couple of days old, but the chip, they don't exactly know how long in production that it's been. But if you do a bit of Googling for AMD ARM, it's certainly not the first time that we heard about this, when the rumours of the original Zen architecture, which at the time was mostly known as Summit Ridge, were really coming to kind of the fray back in 2016, we heard uh, AMD themselves confirm K12, which is an ARM-based processor. It's 64-bit and it's a V8 design. Of course, we never saw this chip come to market. Then earlier this year, again, if you do some Googling, you can find out that Komachi, again, a well-known leaker, um, had actually found multiple entries of a K12-based chip, and this is between 2017 and 2022. Now, assuming all of this information is accurate, and I do believe that it's very likely to be accurate, AMD have a lot of options, because you may also recall that... Um, one of the things we do know about Intel is they are going to be switching to a big dot little type of design. I've detailed this heavily, but with Alder Lake S, um, it seems that there will be basically two types of cores, the high performance cores and the smaller, less power hungry cores. But I also covered a patent from AMD themselves, and it, well... Basically detailed, well, I'll read out the title verbatim, instruction subset implementation for low power operation. And this patent was more recently published, although it was first filed back in 2017. So the timing of all of this does seem to make sense, especially as we know how long it takes for a processor architecture to go through development until release. What my guess is, is that we're going to be seeing... Um, well, basically all of the companies have significant offerings in different power envelopes and different architectures. Windows themselves, um, as Microsoft themselves, also have pretty decent x86 emulation, and this is something that they've been pushing as well. Now, I don't think AMD are going to say, nope, no more x86, we're throwing it out the window. No, it's not happening anymore. Of course, this is not the case. We know that Zen 4 is quite far along in design. AMD have even confirmed, I believe, publicly Zen 5 at this point, and they have stated that there are other architectures which will live on perhaps after that, whether that's Zen or whether they call it, I don't know, fish fingers, we don't know. But what we are pretty certain of is that x86 is not going to go anywhere for AMD, but I do think that ARM-based cores also have a ton of advantages. I may go further into this in a separate video another time, but the long and short of it is that I am very convinced at this point that NVIDIA are also working on an ARM-based uh, processor, which will rival x86. In fact, I've had a couple of people DM me 
uh, some of the more nuanced details of the processor, and I'm not allowed to say what they are because I was asked to not repeat them, uh, at least yet. But the gist is that um, I'm like 95% positive that NVIDIA are doing this. And given what we've learned about AMD, I don't think they're slackers. They know exactly what um, the future of the uh, kind of market is going to be. I think that it, it could be really exciting. I'm not someone who um, is necessarily 100% uh, on the bandwagon of ARM for everything, but I, I do think that ARM has a ton of interesting opportunities, especially, for example, ARM for uh, mobile-type solutions with NVIDIA because of the lower power envelope. Emulation of x86 could be kind of interesting there. But again, until this stuff is formally announced, we can't get ultra excited. Um, but it is interesting at the very least to think of what could become. Switching things to the mobile and a GPU segment for a moment. There are some interesting things discovered by both Patrick on Twitter and Igor from Igor's Lab. The first of which is that Narve 23, we have some idea as to the specifications. Narve 23 is going to feature a 128 bit bus, so my information there does seem to be accurate, with either 4 or 8 gigabytes of memory likely supported. Um, obviously, this will depend upon pricing, configurations, and the normal jazz. Um, we are looking at this particular GPU, at least according to what Igor has leaked, off of five display outputs, which could be supported, although, of course, whether they will be is totally different. We are looking at DisplayPort, HDMI 2.1, USB Type-C, and um, obviously you can have a mix and match of those configurations, like you can have a couple of different display ports and a HDMI and a USB-C or whatever. The clock frequency has just a maximum speed of 2350, which is much lower than the 3 gigahertz, which is the maximum, well, not even theoretical, the maximum limit of Narve 21. Of course, that with Narve 21 is with overclocking uh, in mind. Narve 23 here does seem to be the mobile solution, so 2350 is still fairly respectable. As for power consumption, the TGP, so that's total graphics power, not the total board power, is 65, 80, and 90 watts. So again, of course, that will really depend upon the configuration of the GPU as to how much energy it's going to sap. Patrick on Twitter has also provided some information of Narve 22 Mobile, and it seems that we are still looking at 40 compute units for this thing, with the higher-end SKUs offering 146 watts TGP. Oh, and he did make a typo on the 190-bit uh, bus interface. It's actually 192, of course, and typos are easily done. Um, these processors, or rather graphics cards, could be very interesting for the mobile segment. Um, the 40 compute unit variants for the desktop I do think are going to do rather well against uh, NVIDIA's kind of mid-tier, upper mid-tier offerings. But uh, as always, until we actually get reviews or the hardware is actually launched, it's kind of difficult to say. Another very interesting story that I feel anyway that is worth discussing is the PlayStation 5. As the price reportedly was actually decided in early 2020, it was actually prior to the lockdown, which of course has gripped a lot of the world, and they didn't change it. This is according to an interview that Edge managed to score with the president and CEO over at Sony Interactive Entertainment, Jim Ryan. We fixed on our product lineup late last year. We preferred pricing, well, our preferred pricing, excuse me, was determined early in the calendar year, pre-lockdown. We just go on and executed on what we wanted to do. No, we didn't change the price, no. We've been able to launch the PlayStation 5 at 399 with all of the horsepower and the feature set that the console has, at the same price that we launched the PlayStation 4 back in 2013. That was important to us, and we're very happy that we've been able to do that. 399 worked very well for us last time round, and we'd like for that to work very well for us this time round too. End quote. So, I do think that um, this kind of shows us just how long this stuff has been set in stone from Sony as well as Microsoft. I, obviously, Sony and Microsoft, they have to play things a little cagey, and there may be last-minute 
more pricing decision changes if for example a competitor does do something that is unexpected but largely speaking most of the time these things are decided quite far ahead of time because what you need to do of course is know what the bill of material is per console decide what you want in terms of profit or perhaps even considering a loss per system and uh, you will also need to figure out things such as supply chain, how much shipping is going to cost. And of course, you're pricing this down, down to every single nut and bolt in the system. You know how much the casing, the, the cooling solution, the RAM, the SSD, the, you know, the chips, what the, what the yields are going to be, everything. You've priced all of this stuff to, you know, the dime, the last dime, the last cent of the console. And, um, I think Sony uh, actually nailed a really good price with the PlayStation uh, 5. Um, 399 I think, for the discless version is a smart decision. And when there was some skepticism from people and they thought, no, it was going to be like 449, I admit that I did kind of feel that it could be possible, but I often would say that, no, I'm pretty sure it's going to be 399 because Sony obviously wanted to push people towards digital purchases. Which, I do understand convenience, like digital is definitely the way to go. It's a pain in the ass having to get up and change discs, <laughs> to be honest with you, um, in some instances. And in some ways as well, it also kind of negates some of the point of the kind of being able to quickly switch between, you know, titles of this next generation. So there is that as well. But while the physical cost of, for example, the Blu-ray drive and the small changes in the console, uh, such as the additional moulding of the plastic for the casing and so on, doesn't account for the 100 bucks we're looking at, as I mentioned prior to the announcement of the price, ultimately what Sony want you to do is get involved in its ecosystem. And this way you cannot just trade games with your friend. You cannot just... Um, pick the game up, you know, used and save yourself 20 bucks or, you know, trade it in and GameStop and get like $2 for it. It's like you're basically just completely and utterly locked into Sony's ecosystem. And one of the benefits, of course, of, for example, doing that on PC, um, and I am being a little hypocritical because I, I obviously I'm stuck with uh, digital games on the PC as well, is that uh, you do have more options available Although, let's be honest, 90% of people have to use Steam anyway. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, Sony and Microsoft both kind of knew what the prices were going to be ahead of time. I think Sony did really well with the 399 price point. I think it was a very smart decision of the company, honestly. Um, and all, the other thing too is that they went a very different route from Microsoft. The uh, Obviously, the Xbox Series S and Series X are two quite different consoles, whereas with the PlayStation 5, you've basically got one version with a disc and one version without a disc drive. So they're essentially the same, other than one small you know, difference that one cannot take physical media. I might as well also throw in a small piece of news for Halo Infinite. And I say it's a small piece of news because it's not confirmation as to release date. But Bruce Thomas, who's an actor, they perform the motion capture for Master Chief in Halo Infinite. Uh, this is via the Dan Allen Gaming YouTube channel, so of course I'll link the video in the description. Um, they've mentioned that as far as they know, that is the actor, the game is ready to go in spring. So that's spring 2021. Now, naturally, this is assuming that there are no other hiccups, nothing else that slows the project down. They don't need to make any last-minute decisions or optimization. So, spring 2021 is the release date we should see Halo Infinite. Of course, assuming there are no delays or anything else that needs to be done to the game. I'm actually really looking forward to it. Uh, there is not going to be any presence of it, apparently, at the Game Awards because... Um, Basically, the game was supposed to be out by now, as you probably are aware. So they're not putting a trailer of it yet, and they obviously need to wow with this version of the game. They are going to be doing quite a lot, I imagine, to bring it up to where we expect it visually. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the game actually is like on delivery. And I don't just mean the graphics, I, I just mean the entire experience. I'm actually quite a fan of Halo. Um, I don't play it online. 
um, or anything like that. I don't play competitively. I just like the story. I just think it's pretty awesome. I've gone through like all of the Halos. Um, and I, I just, you know, I'm more of a fan of single player games anyway. I just like the experiences. So I'm, I'm kind of hyped to see what Halo Infinite brings to the table. Obviously, the original debut of it was kind of disappointing. So yeah, let's hope it's better. <laughs> But uh, with that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. The normal stuff, if you did, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.